The UFL season begins this weekend. I got some storylines and some players that you should know to get you set for its first season. And we need to talk about some NFL draft diamonds in the rough. Let's go. It's the number one college football show. What's up, kid folk? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching on the Fox Sports app, YouTube, or listening wherever you get your podcast. Today on the show, I'm going to get you set for the UFSLs, uh, USFLs, the UFLs season to begin on this Saturday, featuring a clash of champions, Birmingham Stallions versus the Arlington Renegades, who I think is going to win. Some players you should watch and I'm going to get into just what this season could mean for so many players that are participating in the UFL this year. But first, let's talk about our top five diamonds in the rough in 2024's NFL draft. Yes, we are starting the show with a list. I know how much y'all love it when I rank stuff, right? So I'm going to go five to one here. And I'm going to explain my decisions in each one of these. But I also want to acknowledge that the NFL draft is a system, and we've got way more great college football players than we have spots to get selected in the NFL drafts. Matter of fact, my favorite phrase on this, or my favorite retort on this, is Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, right? Asked, hey, look, what does it mean to be Mr. Irrelevant? You know, your last guy drafted. To which he would say, do you know how many guys play in the NFL that didn't get drafted? I was picked by the San Francisco 49ers. That's my energy. When I do these things, right? I know that there are players that can play all over the map, and I want to highlight a few of them. So number five, I'm going to go with a specialist in Iowa's Tory Taylor, who I think is a great cop to, wait for it, Pat McAfee. Now, I understand, okay, what you feel about this. But when you talk about Tory Taylor's leg and you talk about Pat McAfee's leg, yes, they're both actual. They point at their right legs, and yes, they have absolute hammers on their leg. Matter of fact, it reminds me of a Boondocks episode where they were spoofing 24, where my man just had you know a Titanic boot where he just went around kicking people in the nads. That is what I think Torrey Taylor's foot is like, and that's what Pat McAfee's foot was like. More importantly, Torrey Taylor averaged 46.3 yards per punt at Iowa. Pat McAfee averaged 46.4 yards per punt in the NFL over 575 punts. Now, it's also important to note that Torrey Taylor is the most decorated punter of all time. That is not hyperbole. That is a fact. He is a unanimous and consensus All-American. As a matter of fact, not only did they root for punts at Iowa, which is perfectly Iowa, but I bet that Kirk Ferentz thought of Torrey Taylor as his offense. Like, I'm, I wish I was being joking about this, but given the style of defense they played, and remember, Phil Parker was the Broyles Award winner because his defense has been legitimately awesome the last couple of years. And their offense has been all but non-existent. Torrey Taylor was your best chance to score outside of pick six. Strip sack, fumble, return for touchdown. Okay? They actually got shirts to say punts. You know, I think that if you're going to select a specialist, in the NFL draft, this is the first one to go off the board. I, I remember Michael Dixon coming out of Texas going to Seattle, and people were going, why are you selected a punter? Well, it turns out to be a really solid investment for them. And you know what? As far as specialists are concerned, kickers and punters, it's air conditioning, right? Nobody notices when the air conditioning is running. Nobody high fives their furnace. But when that stops, stops working, everybody knows about it. And that person gets fired real quick. And people like, say, Justin Tucker at the Baltimore Ravens play forever. That is what I think Tory Taylor is going to be in the NFL. Okay, next on the list, let's go from specialist to the most important position in all of football. That's quarterback. I'm going to go with South Carolina Gamecock Spencer Rattler. I got history with Spencer. I go back to high school with Spencer when I was beginning to start to do this as a day job. And I was trying to secure guests for a podcast that I did called Woosaw, which is the whole thing. Spencer did the show from his car after practice with me. 
talk with me for 40 minutes. It's it's still out there on the socials if you are inclined to listen. And I, I listened to it a few weeks ago and I was kind of mirac- I was mesmerized by what he had to say and how prescient he was. That said, he's supposed to be what Caleb Williams was at Oklahoma, absolutely gets benched for Caleb Williams in 2021, goes into the portal, comes out with Shane Beamer and becomes his quarterback for the last two years. Three out of four years, he's passed for at least 3,000 yards. And we talk about value, which is what a diamond in the rough is, a tremendously talented player that is undervalued. I think as we get down the list of quarterbacks, Rattler's going to be right there because there are really six guys that we're talking about, right, four in the first round, depending on how you feel about Bo Nix or Michael Penix, right? But if you're looking at a guy that you want to draft that you think could be your heir apparent a little bit later on, I think you could do worse than Spencer Rattler. As a matter of fact, the way I look at it this way, y'all know I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. News is Dak Prescott ain't getting no extension, which I'm going, cool. That's what Trey Lance is for. You know what I'm saying? You hear what I'm saying? All right? So a lot of y'all that already just wanted to punt Dak three years ago, but that's what Trey Lance is for. I think that's what Spencer Rattler can be for an NFL franchise. He's smart. He's savvy. He's taken his lumps. He's come back. I'm very excited to see what his future looks like as a professional after stints at Oklahoma and South Carolina playing in the Big 12 and the SEC, understanding what it means to play quarterback at a high level. Okay, next on the list, talk about a linebacker. Jalen Ford coming out of Texas. I like Jalen Ford in 2022, but that's not saying much because everybody liked Jalen Ford in 2022. He had 119 tackles and four picks. However, his production took a step back as the team got better in 2023, and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think 91 tackles in 2023 on a team that won its first Big 12 championship since 2009, made his first trip ever to the college football playoff, is because of him. I understand you feel some way about Tavondre Sweat. Cool, that's fine. I understand you feel some way about the secondary. Cool, that's fine. Or even what the offense was capable of doing. But the heart and soul of that defense, Jalen Ford, because if that dude wasn't holding down the middle, we're talking about Anthony Hill not being able to come flying off the edge to be the special talent that he is at outside linebacker. The cop here for me is Kenneth Murray Jr. He is that much of a tackling machine. He is that good inside. And he can run with tight ends, and he'll come downhill in a hurry. He has speed. We just don't think of it in the same way that we say we think of someone running 4 3 4 4. Linebackers that can fly in four, five, four, sixes are still fast, right? Especially in these short distances where you got guys like Jalen Ford who know how to play football, which is another way of saying he ain't taking no false steps. Okay. He sees it, he fires. That is a thing that is difficult to teach. I spent so much time picking apart defenses because linebackers had false steps. You have that about there playing happy feet, tap dancing. No, that that cross is open now, right? Or you're late on the read. Jalen Ford is not. I think he's going to be able to play a long time at linebacker in the NFL. Next on the list, talk about another outstanding player that's being slept on. Michigan running back Blake Horam. Somehow, we're looking at a running back class that ain't necessarily that deep. And people are kind of out on Blake Corum because he basically had the same year that Jalen Ford had. So he had an outstanding year in 2022. Rushing for over 1,400 yards on a team that made the college football playoff on a team that won a Big Ten championship. Blew out his ACL. Okay? Comes back, rushes for 1,200 yards on a team that goes 15-0 undefeated, wins the national championship, and somehow he ain't that good. I'm sorry, what? No, that's not how that goes. The comp for me in the NFL is Josh Jacobs. Does he have the speed of Josh Jacobs? No. But he does have the work rate because that was what John Gruden was drafting All the way back when the Raiders still played, you know, for John Gruden, it was, I need a tailback that can carry the load and can put up with the amount of pressure that I'm going to put on him to be in every down back. Blake Corm can do that for you. I would not be shocked to find out in the second, third, fourth round that Blake Corm ends up going to the Los Angeles Chargers to play quarterback behind Justin Herbert for Jim Harbaugh once again. Outstanding talent, outstanding player, right, who is also In graduate school, his last year at Michigan. Then last on the list, the dude I think is most slept on in this NFL draft, a real diamond in the rough, is Wisconsin running back Braylon Allen. 
The cop for me at six foot two, two forty five is Derrick Henry. Sneer if you want. But those of you that remember Braylon Allen's freshman year and sophomore year know exactly what I'm talking about. This was a 17-year-old who became an 18-year-old, became a 19-year-old turning 20, who was wrecking Big Ten competition, playing tailback at Wisconsin when we still thought of it as being built by the tailback in the offensive line. His production took a step back in a big way in 2023, but that's because the offense that he was playing in changed dramatically. He goes from back-to-back -back years of rushing for 1,200 yards to just 984 on the ground. Phil Longo had changed the offense to feature more of the quarterback and the wide receivers, less on, hey, we're going to hand the ball to the tail black and play complementary defense like we come to know with Paul Chris, all the way back to Brent Bielema and so forth, so on, right? I think that Braylon Allen has an opportunity to land at a program franchise, excuse me, that would feature him for the value. Right. If he goes the third, fourth, fifth round, that wouldn't shock me. Second round wouldn't shock me either. Like Joe Mixon type, right? Smaj P. Ryan type. But you're going to get the value that Derrick Henry is going to provide to the Baltimore Ravens right now. Okay. Is he going to be as talented as Derrick Henry at Tennessee? I don't know. I, I don't want to put that on him. I don't want to put on him being the dude that Derrick Henry was for them for so long. That said, what Derrick Henry is going to be able to provide to Baltimore, I think Braylon Allen can do it a rookie as they are basically on the on different trajectories in their careers. But you get my point here, the size, the strength, the speed, and frankly, the youth, which is not a topic that people are very comfortable talking about in the NFL. But if I'm evaluating 1v1, best on best, and the pros and cons are the same, the differentiating factor for me is how old are you? Lamar Jackson is not yet 30. He's won MVP twice because he got in this league very, very quickly. Stetson Bennett seemed to join this thing as a 40-year-old. He's not. Could you get my point here, right? If you can go get youth at that position, at tailback, a position that wears out very quickly and maybe get a little bit more length on his career, you go do that, especially with the pedigree of being a Wisconsin tailback like Jonathan Taylor, Monty Ball, Melvin Gordon. You get what I'm saying here. So those are the five diamonds in the rough that I see ahead of this 2024 NFL draft. Let me know what you think. Tweet us at number one show on Twitter. Hit us on the threads, on the Instagrams, on the Facebooks. You know where I'm at on the YouTubes, right? Because that's where you're watching this. Okay. Now, the United Football League begins its season this Saturday with a clash of champions. We're going to get to see USFL champion Birmingham at XFL champion Arlington to kick off this 2024 season, the first in the UFL's history. I right, top line here. This USF, uh, USFL, I'm going to say it. We're going to get past it, I promise. The U, This UFL is the deepest spring league that we have seen since the 1985 USFL, right? The one where we had seen Mike Rozier, Herschel Walker, Doug Flutie, talk about three Heisman winners in that 1980s era of USFL football. As a matter of fact, 1985, the Birmingham Stallions used their first pick on Jerry Rice coming out of Mississippi Valley State. Like that's that's the level of talent that we're talking about. However, going into this year with the XFL and the USFL no longer fighting for players, the two have combined, kept four from each league and created four team conferences. And now we get to see some of these dudes that can absolutely play. Now, before I get into those players, one of the things that I think is really great about the United Football League is how forward-thinking the brass is about its rules. Because the whole point of this is to make this an easier watch for you and me, right? The length of the games is dramatically shorter than the NFL or even college football. And you've seen both the NFL and college football Make measures, take measures to try to shorten their game, right? With timeouts, TV timeouts, and what have you. But I think earlier today, or I should say earlier today, early on Tuesday, when the NFL announced that it was going to adopt the XFL's kickoff rule for 2024, you get to see the value of a spring football league like this one playing, where the NFL gets to watch it evaluate what it's doing well, and perhaps adopt some of those things that make a more entertaining game. So what they're adopting is the kickoff rule from the XFL, which is going to allow for more returns.
for so long, you and I have been conditioned not to watch the kickoff because we know it's probably going to be a touchback. Either somebody's going to kick it out of the back of the end zone or somebody's going to catch it and take a knee or somebody's going to catch it, call fair catch, going to go to TV timeout and break, right? What if you could turn that into the kind of spectacle that it once was? Some of y'all know De- uh, Devin Hester. None of y'all know Dante Hall. I mean, some of y'all know Dante Hall because y'all my age, but the human joystick was real. And yet Kansas City, who wasn't nobody, had this dude that we were saying, don't kick it to him, and he would run it back, right? Or the stories that can come out of these things. Desmond Howard telling a story about, hey, I was playing in the NFL, and I watched Deion Sanders get hyped and mad that somebody had scored a touchdown. So he said, put me in there. I'm going to get six. Put him back there. He ran it back. Last year, I was in Memphis at Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium to watch Derek Dillon pull his heels up off of the back of the end zone and return a kickoff for the longest touchdown for kickoff return in pro football history, 109 and a half yards. One of the coolest experiences that I've ever had in a stadium. What if you could give more of those? What if you could turn the returner into the star that he once was, right? And this, again, goes back to something that spring football, particularly the USFL in 2022, did well. Kevontae Turpin won MVP. One of the reasons that he won MVP is because that dude could take it back, right? That was a dude that had washed out of Texas Christian, didn't really have a future in the NFL, rehabilitated himself in the USFL, and turned himself into an MVP that got onto the roster for the Dallas Cowboys and was voted an All-Pro in his first year as a Dallas Cowboy that same year for what he could do returning the football, right? So we're going to be watching specialists already. Those rules, as they continue to come into the UFL should get your attention because you could be watching those things on Sundays in the fall. Now, another storyline that I think is going along with how deep this particular league is, is just how many names you know and how many players you know in this league. So for starters here, right? Adrian Martinez played Nebraska, played Kansas State, Birmingham Stallion. Matt Corral, who was on this show, Right, getting ready for the NFL draft just last year, Birmingham Stallion. Jamar Smith, who's been a part of two USFL champion Birmingham Stallions, right? He's back. And that's just over there in Birmingham. At Arlington, Luis Perez, who's played in both the XFL and USFL, probably starts this year as the starter for Bob Stoops. Behind him, Lindsey Scott, one of the most prolific passers in FCS in 2022. And behind him, Whole Nailers, who was Tim Tebow light at East Carolina, right? To, not to mention there are a number of former Oklahoma players on Arlington's roster, right? Guys like Jalen Redmond, Drew Samia, you'll continue to go here, right? That's just kicking off this clash of champions, which I'm really excited about because I spent so much time with Birmingham in the last couple of years, and we all know how I feel about Coach Stoops, right? By the way. Another plug here, if you haven't watched the video essay that we did about Oklahoma over the last 25 years and what it means for the Sooners to play football and to be the pro football team in this state, please give that your time. i am really been overwhelmed by the positive reception that we received from this because it felt like we got this one right. Now, on top of all of that, that's just two of the six teams in this league that are going to feature players like A.J. McCarron, who asked for his release from Cincinnati so he could play for the St. Louis Battlehawks, and Anthony Beck. Anthony Beck, who is the head coach of the most popular UFL team in the St. Louis Battlehawks, who regularly get 30,000 folks to show up to their dome to watch them play, and they are going to have the honor of hosting the UFL championship game on Father's Day this year. Anthony Beck, whose son Rocco Beck, turned into an absolute star at Iowa State playing quarterback for Matt Campbell, right? Keep going down the line here. Danny Etling, remember him coming out of LSU? A dude that I don't think can actually go back to Georgia for, you know, reasons. He is going to be in this league, along with other guys like Case Cookins, who was on a Philadelphia Stars team that came seemingly out of nowhere in 2022 to what ended up being an outstanding run to the playoffs, right? And then had a great season last year. He's going to play for the Memphis Showboats. And John D. Filippo, 
who was so excited to be a head coach for the New Orleans Breakers, now defunct New Orleans Breakers last year, who's going to be calling plays from that sideline, right? Going to get opportunities to guys like Cook is who comes out of the FCS like Lindsey Scott and turns himself into a spring football league star. Jordan Tamu, who's again, played in both leagues, right? First beginning his career in the USFL last year, doing an outstanding job for the DC defenders. And this year he's got guys like Davin Bellamy coming back. Another guy that's played in both leagues and Abram Smith who rushed for 1600 yards Baylor just a couple of years ago and is the leading rusher last year across both leagues. There's talent everywhere. I mean, Scooby Wright is back at Birmingham, one of the most decorated defensive players in all of college football ever. Slade Bold, remember him? Playing slot receiver at Alabama. He's at Birmingham. Demarcus Gates returns. He's probably going to play another season with a fluff pick in his mouth. Cool. He was able to play with Chicago Bears and went just fine doing the same damn thing. Wayne Goldman is going to be taking tailback for the St. Louis Battlehawks, a dude that was a part of some outstanding Clemson teams. Again, I throw a rock. I hit an all-conference player. I hit an All-American. I hit a Blitnikoff Award winner like Corey Coleman, the leading tackler, to say, the defensive player of the year last year, Frank Ginda. This is going to be an outstanding year for those of us that have lived and breathed spring football for the last couple of years because along with these guys, we're also going to get to see who can be the next, not just Kevontae Turpin, but Brandon Aubrey. Brandon Aubrey is a very interesting case of what spring football can do for the NFL and for these players to get into it. Brandon Aubrey had never played football before he got to the Birmingham Stallions. Okay. He helped design the USFL ball that they used in 2022. And then when they went away from putting the technology in the balls that allowed for tracking, all of a sudden began to go on a tear. And GMs across the league would tell me, that guy needs to be on an NFL roster somewhere. And I don't know much about specialists, right? I know defensive back play. I know quarterbacks. After that, I usually defer. But what I saw was a dude that made his kicks. And he's making kicks on a team that wins championships. Finally gets an opportunity. Training camp for the Dallas Cowboys. Makes the team. And then proceeds to set an NFL record for the most consecutive field goals made by a kicker. All pro in his rookie year. In the NFL, after swearing up and down, he's going to play soccer because he was a great defender at Notre Dame, even had a career for the Toronto F- or Toronto FC, excuse me, in an LS. He's going to try to give them a the mascot. They ain't got one. The point here is this is an opportunity you can get. So can Donald DeLahaye, destroying on the YouTubes, be that next guy from the specialist? He's going to play for the San Antonio Brahmas. We'll see, right? I know that he has been all over the socials for the UFL, and I would expect that he wants to have a big year because we know what his entertainment value provides to the league. Now he gets an opportunity to show to the NFL that, hey, it's not just the entertainment value I can provide you. My leg is actual. I will kick it from wherever I got to kick it, and we'll make it do what it do. That's all over the map, right? I'm curious to find out who from this crop of UFL players gets an opportunity at the next level, not just in training camp now, because we're past that, right? We know that UFL players are going to get training camp invites. Who can make rosters? Who can get a check? Who can go from making 5500 a game in the UFL to $800,000, $700,000, life-changing generational wealth because they took the opportunity given to them in this 10-game season to show folks what they could do on national television, Big Fox, FS1, ESPN, ESPN2, the games, all 43 of them are going to be nationally televised. We're all going to get to see what these guys are made of each and every week. I could not be more excited about that. And because I could not be more excited about that, we will return on April 2nd with our UFL Power Rankings week to week. Okay? So I'm going to rank them one to eight. Somebody's going to get their feelings hurt because somebody got to be eight. Somebody's going to get talking to because they got to be one, right? I'm very curious to find out how this game between, say, Arlington and Birmingham goes because I think both of those teams are in positions to say, no, 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 it's ours, to which Birmingham would be like, hey, dog, we make a business of winning. Y'all got lucky in a playoff and won a couple of games with a losing record. I'm sure that Arlington at home wants to make it do what it do and put that to rest. I'm also very interested to see how it works out with these respective conferences because 
I think as I evaluate the USFL conference and the XFL conference, folks that have been watching one or the other more often are already going to be pulling for somebody, right? To say nothing of, do you know some of these players on these teams? I'm curious to see who can get the better of each other, the XFL or the USFL, because bragging rights will very much be at stake. And I think this is a very good thing. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Then we will debut for the first time, as we have done a spring football show here, the MVP power rankings week to week for the entire year, 2024. The reason that we are doing this is because the MVP in the USFL has made it to the NFL and remained in the NFL. Kevontae Turpin with the Dallas Cowboys. Last year, Alex Magoo got to watch as his dude. I can't believe I'm going to say this. As, as the Green Bay Packers embarrassed the Dallas Cowboys in a playoff that Green Bay Packers were not supposed to be in. Full credit to my guy, Alex Magoo, right, who has been outstanding in the USFL. I'm glad he got the win, but Jerry, stop scribbling on the pad, dog, and get us some teams here that can play. Get us some players that can win that game. We get we getting roasted. But the point is, he's not returning to the UFL, right? He gets to stay in Green Bay and help them build toward what they hope is another run at the playoffs and perhaps a run at the Super Bowl in 2024. So we're going to keep tabs on individual performances from kickoff returns to wide receivers to quarterbacks, see who can do, right? I expect this to be a really clean product too. And that was always going to be kind of my worry going into spring football is what's the offensive line going to be like? What's quarterback play going to be like? Is it going to look a little too high school football? No, it's not been really the case, but the caliber of quarterback play is so good. And the offensive line talent is so good that we're going to see, I think really the best product that we have seen since spring football returned in a big way in 2022. And we're going to talk about it for the next 10, 11, 12 weeks right here on the number one college football show. That is going to do it for this episode of our number one college football show. Number one college football show lead of screening is Jack Coakley. Additional support from Kiara Santana and Jim Cunningham, who put the special in our special teams. Producer JV on Duncan, make sure the recruits and the rivals see the cake we bake. Technical director Chaz Boulay sends in the signal. Senior producer Catherine Cordaggi sees the entire field from the booth. Lead producer Tyler Wojak calls the plays from the sideline and the play snaps on my clap. We will see y'all back here live on Tuesday. Till then, stay low. Keep those feet driving. Doses. <laughs>